because they're giving to the wrong thing. They're giving to that which is not getting a job done for God. I get so weary today of people say, I gave to this program or I gave to this work. And I happen to know that that particular thing is as wrong as it could be, that it's run just for the self-interest of some individual. I know one organization that 90% of what's given to it stays in this country to support a tremendous overhead that keeps men driving Cadillac automobiles over here. But my, how pitiful it's made to look the plea that they make. Why, my friend, that means if you want to give $10 to help overseas somewhere, you'd have to give $100 to get $10 over there. I say that there's something wrong with Christians the way they give. And there wouldn't be these things that are wrong if Christians were as smart as these men of the world are. I watched them down here. I watched one man in particular. This man never would invest in anything unless he was sure about it. My, he was smart. Smart money, they called it, by the way. How much smart money do you have? Are you really using it today to get the Word of God out? This is a tremendous parable that our Lord is giving here. And he says, do you think God's going to trust you with heavenly riches if today you're not using that which he's given you down here? And actually, therefore, money is spiritual, is it not? And you're responsible not only for giving, but the way that you give. This is a glorious, wonderful parable. Now he says, verse 13, No servant can serve two masters, for either he'll hate the one, love the other, or else he'll hold to the one, despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And so what are you doing with your money, friends? Are you making any money? And what are you doing with it? That's a pertinent question, you see. Using it for mammon, the things of the world? Well, if you are, well, the one you're serving, that's your master, whoever you're serving you can't serve God and mammon both. Now, the Pharisees, they got under conviction on this one. The Pharisees also, who were covetous, heard all these things, and they derided him. He said unto them, Ye are they which justify yourselves before men, but God knoweth your hearts. That's a stinger, let me tell you. God knows your heart, and he knows mine. We can put up a front with each other, but not with God. For that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. The law and the prophets were until John, since that time, the kingdom of God is preached, and every man presseth into it. And it's easier for heaven and earth to pass than one tittle of the law to fail. God judges on that kind of basis, you see. You and I can't measure up to it. Now, here is a verse of Scripture that if this is the only verse we had, there'd be no such thing as divorce, of course. That is, for a Christian. Whoso putteth away his wife, and marrieth another, committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her that is put away from her husband, committeth adultery. Now, that must be compared with the 19th chapter of Matthew, and also 1 Corinthians, the 7th chapter. You need to take all of the Scripture on a particular theme, and not just lift out one verse here. This, I think, our Lord's given to these men who are under law, in that day, who were making light of the law of God. Now we come here to another great parable that only Dr. Luke gives. And if you've already discovered, have you not, that Dr. Luke gives some wonderful parables. And this is no exception. This is a parable that is amazing. We call it the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. Now this is going to lead me to say something that I think is very important. I do not think that the Lord Jesus ever made up a parable. I think that every one of them he drew from real life. I think he always got right down to the nitty-gritty, right where people live, and he just reached out and drew these parables in. When he says, Behold, a sower went forth to sow, those people there had seen a hundred sowers on a hundred hills in that land sowing seed. They knew exactly what he's talking about. And I think that all of these... Now, this is an unusual parable, and uh, make sure that you and I understand that he's not making this one up. He gives us the name of one of the individual, a beggar named Lazarus. And therefore, 
he wouldn't give the name of somebody that didn't exist. So what we have here is a parable, and it's a wonderful parable, by the way. Let me begin reading. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen, and he fared sumptuously every day. Now, a certain rich man, and this is a tremendous story, by the way, that he's giving to us here. And this rich man that he's talking about here is a rich man that lived without God, and he died without God. And it moves into a realm that you and I know nothing about. This parable, our Lord, will pass from this world to the next without making any break at all. There's no hocus-pocus here, or acracadabra. Although the curtain between this life and the next life and this doorway of death, we know so little about it, yet our Lord bridged it here without any strain or stress at all. Now, when man is left to his own imagination, he seeks out many inventions, and he'd make unlimited speculation and wildest dreams. And today he does the most fantastic schemes that are imaginable. Imagine freezing the body of Lenin in order to try to make him come to life or make him look lifelike. Well, man using his imagination is in trouble. And in this parable, we stand before the iron curtain of death and we cannot penetrate it. Now, the important thing, what does the Word of God say? And there were only three men that ever spoke with authority on the other side of death. One is the Lord Jesus, of course, and the other is John, and then also, I should say, Paul. Paul was caught up to the third heaven. Now, we find that this rich man here, and we need to recognize that he was a rich man that really put on the dog. That's the picture that you have here. He fared sumptuously every day. He put on the dog, and the poor man, the dogs licked his sores. I'm reading. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. Now, here are two men at the opposite ends of the social ladder and the financial ladder, and I suppose every other ladder. One represents the very top echelon of riches, and the other represents the lowest extreme of poverty. I do not think you could have two men any farther apart than these two men. And this poor man was dependent on the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. He never was invited to sit at the table, but he was one that had to be kept in a menial place. And we find that the dogs came and licked his sores. That is certainly the very depths of the terrible degradation and despair that this poor man is in. Now, we read here that this is their condition in this life. And I'm sure had you lived in that town, you might have got the impression that that poor man dressed in rags didn't have very much in the way of any spiritual discernment or spiritual riches. I'm sure all of us would have written him off And then on the other hand, there's this rich man, and I'm sure that he had several buildings around named after him. I'm of the opinion that there's one of them called the Rich Memorial. Probably it could have been a church, it could have been a school, it could have been a mission enterprise. I'm of the opinion that this man had a wonderful name in the town that these two men lived in. And this is all that men saw. On the outward side, there's this rich man, and believe me, he was clothed in purple, and he fared sumptuously, and that means he put on the dog. The poor beggar, why, the dogs licked his sores. Now, that is a picture of abject poverty of Lazarus. 